Hello everyone, welcome to Michelangelo stage. Our next speaker is a mobile photography expert, Mr. Richard Gray. Thanks, hi, yes, it's working, good. Thanks uh, Irene and thanks to Campus Party for inviting me to, to speak again. And as Irene said, I'm gonna talk today about photography with mobile devices and specifically today photography with the iPhone. My name's Richard Gray and I'm Rugfoot on uh, all the social media stuff, Flickr, Instagram, Twitter, etc. if you want to find me. Um, I have taken lots of photos with uh, the iPhone and I also blog about photography with the iPhone and I also uh, have written in various places, including The Guardian, about photography with the iPhone. Um, but I'm also a big camera photographer. I take photos with a very expensive uh, Canon 5D as well for one of the big um, agencies here in the UK. So I feel as though I, I have a good view of how mobile photography fits in with photography generally on the, in, a, in a broader context. But today what I'm going to talk about is some of the techniques that first really got me into mobile photography. When I first got onto Instagram and I started seeing some of the stuff that people were doing, I mean, I've been taking photos for many years, but I was just really amazed at what people were doing with that little camera over there. And I asked around and I badgered people to tell me how they did stuff and they told me there was this app for that and that app for this and this is how you do this. And I was just astounded at how many different things you can do with the apps that are out there. And I, I teach a class in photography with the iPhone. Um, it was the first one of its kind last year with uh, a college here in London, Kensington and Chelsea College. And now I'm, I'm running it with the British Journal of Photography. And I also ran it with uh, the Photographer's Gallery. And you might be thinking, well, how do I, how do I fill up, a, in this case, 15 hours of class time with photography with the iPhone? The camera is just a tiny little thing. All it does is take pictures, and it's got a couple of other things. So how, what do I, what do I fill, fill the time with? Well, I'm going to show you just a very small fraction of some of the things that I, I talk about in my class. And there, for every thing I show you, there, there's about 100 other things that you can do uh, as well. But first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about what mobile photography is. It's quite a new genre. and the broader photography world is, is taking its time to, to get used to what it's all about. And if you ask someone what mobile photography is all, is all about, the first thing they'll say to you is, it's the camera that's always with you. And that's true. I, I forget who said it, but someone said, the best camera is the camera that's always with you. And of course, you've always got your mobile phone with you. And these days, you've always got a camera with you. So if something happens on the street, if a helicopter crashes in central London, or if there's a celebrity that has a, a, a punch up uh, on Oxford Street with someone, someone is already there taking photos of that thing happening. So for photojournalism, it's, it's citizen journalism. Mobile photography has become very important. And the big agencies have started accepting uh, photos from people that have been taken with mobiles because even if it's a bad picture if it's of something interesting that's happening then it's going to be a good picture so that that's true and and mobile photography has been very good at street photography for that precise reason but I would also say it's not only the best camera because it's the one with you but it's also the Photoshop that's in your pocket. What I really found was suddenly this whole world of processing possibilities was open to me wherever I was. I didn't have to wait till I got home to sit behind my desk to use Photoshop. I could do it, do the processing. I could take a picture on my way to work. I could process it, app it up, craft it, do something imaginative to it while I was on the tube. 
and then when I get to work, I can publish it. So for me, the new thing, the big thing, was all the processing. And in my class, that's a lot of what we do. A reason that the college was interested in launching a course in photography with the iPhone was because it saw that this was the new point of access for photography generally. The college also does other courses, more advanced courses in photography with big cameras, but it saw that now the first photos that people take will be with an iPhone or a Samsung S4 or whatever other mobile device. So, so mobile photography has extended photography out to a lot more people and it's a new point of access. So it's a very inclusive thing. A lot of people have talked about it being a, dem de a great democratizing force because a lot of people that would never have taken photography seriously can now uh, do it and be creative and create some really amazing images. And when I, when I launched the course at the Photographer's Gallery, they have a very traditional audience. There were some people that were a little bit, um, a little bit upset by the whole thing. I think a lot of people have spent thousands of pounds on all this kit, and then suddenly some teenage kid comes along and is able to replicate what they've been doing on a mobile phone for apps that just cost a few, a few pence. But in my view, I think that's fantastic because it means if someone is really good at photography, they're going to get spotted because they will be taking photos on their mobile device already, publishing them up to Instagram, and if they're good, they will get um, good feedback, they'll be recognized as a good photographer. And that's the third thing with mobile photography. Suddenly, everyone can publish their photos. I could have taken the most fantastic photo 10 years ago but it probably would have just sat on my hard drive and only my mum would have ever seen it. But now, if I take a really good photo, I, pub I can publish it to Instagram and it will get seen, it'll get picked up. And that's an incredibly motivating process. And you can get a lot of ideas from other people and you can get a lot of motivation from other people. That's incredibly motivating if people say that they like your photography. So there's three things that really characterize mobile photography and where, where it is today. So, okay, I'm just gonna run through some of those techniques that I, that I talked about. They're all things that you can do with Photoshop, but now you can do them wherever you are on your mobile device. So I'm gonna talk about some blurring techniques some retouching, some basic and selective editing of images, some cloning, some blending techniques, and then lastly, I'm just going to look at a few apps that do just really weird things. And um, just before we get going, can I have a show of hands? Who's, who's on Instagram here? Who takes photos? And so probably about half, half the audience. So, so some of these things may be, may be familiar to you. Some of them may not be. You may have just not realized they were there. But, but anyway, okay, this, before I get on to blurring, this is a photo um, that uses a technique that's very common in mobile photography. It's very common because Instagram used it uh, as one of their f standard features a long time ago. And it's uh, a function called tilt shift. And it basically allows you to blur the whole of an image except for one strip or one little circle which you can leave clear. And it's, it's a technique that's been used a lot and it's been used particularly in this case where people take a photo of something that's in the distance and they blur one part of the picture and leave the rest of it unblurred to give a sort of a miniature village effect. And it's interesting because I, I saw at a big exhibition the other day at the National, National Theatre an exhibition of some of the world's best photojournalism, I saw a photo of Buckingham Palace where the photographer had used precisely this, this technique. So it's interesting to see how some of the standard techniques that are being used in mobile photography are starting to enter the, the mainstream of uh, big camera photography. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna switch to the iPhone in a second and just give you an idea of a little demo of how you can generate an image uh, like this, where um, 
unlike tilt shift or like tilt shift, I've blurred particular parts of, a, of, a, of an image. Uh, it doesn't have to be a whole circle or a whole strip. In this case, I'm able to blur very, very particular parts. Okay, and I'm going to use uh, an app called Blur FX, and I forgot to say I'm going to tweet a link to all the apps that I mentioned in this presentation at the end with with the hashtag um, for Campus Party. So if if you want to know what the apps are afterwards, just have a look at that that tweet. No, no need to write down what they are. Okay, if I can switch to the the iPhone there. OK, so I've got a, an image there of, of uh, the British Museum. I don't know if anyone recognizes it, but it's a photo from the inside of the British Museum. It's quite dark, so the photo is quite grainy already. And I've apped it up a little bit. Um, but what I wanted to do is sort of create a little bit of a story with the image and blur the whole of it, except for just a couple of little parts. So with that slider, you, you increase or decrease the blur. And then just with, your, just with your finger, you tap on the parts that you want to unblur. So I'm going to tap on the figure of the, the man there. So you can see he's just emerged. And then I'll tap on the edge of the, edge of the building to give it a sort of a 3D effect. And then along the, the colonnade there, so I've sort of created a little story. It's sort of more of a dreamy, has a more of a dreamy feel to it. Maybe it's a man who's died and gone to heaven. You know, it's got that sort of feel about it. But as, you, as you've seen, you can do it very, very easily just with a couple of little taps. And there are, you can make the blur stronger or weaker. And there are different types of blur. That one's called Gaussian, but there are other types like Median, which sort of creates blocks of, blocks of color, or Motion, which has a sort of a juddery effect. So that's one, one very simple technique. Can I go back to my presentation? Thanks. OK, the next technique is a technique that's been used for, for hundreds of years um, in, the, in the darkroom. Since photography started, people have been removing objects from photos in the darkroom and more recently digitally that they don't want for one, for one reason or another. I mean, the classic cases are uh, political photos where an enemy has been removed from, from a particular picture or a family photo where, if you could afford it in those days, where a, a, a divorced wife has been removed from a picture. But you, aesthetically, you can also just use it to take out things that would spoil an otherwise nice picture. Now, I, I quite like this picture here. But to my eye, I just thought, oh, that, that black box there on the, on the, on the uh, left is just causing a little bit of a distraction to the eye. But with this app, you can just remove it really, really quickly. And similarly, here's a picture I quite like. But I thought, well, I'll be a bit creative with this one. There's nothing particular that makes it a bad picture. But I thought, well, I'll just be a little bit creative with this. And I'll take out, take out the windows. OK, and I'll give you a quick uh, demonstration of how easy that is to do. You could switch to the iPhone. Thanks. Okay, hold on. OK, so I've got this image here. And I, I like these, these cranes, really tall cranes. But I thought, just to really emphasize how, how tall they are, 
it would have been good to take out the, the roofs to, to, so that it's just a very clear, clear picture. So with this app, very simple. You just tap on the, the parts of the picture that you want to remove. And it's very clever because what it does is it, it, it sees where you've cut a hole and it guesses what should go inside that hole. So it sometimes doesn't work very well if what is around the hole is, is uh, not uniform. But in the case of that building that I showed you just before, there were just bricks around the hole, so it was very easy for the app to guess what should go in the hole. But with this one, let's, let's take a look. So you just choose the area you want to remove, and you can really zoom in. And this is a basic technique of masking. You'll, you'll see it used in lots of different apps, but this just makes it really, really easy for you to do. OK, so I've, I've got a, if I had a bit more time, I'd be quite precise in my masking. But let's have a go and see how that works. Just finish it off here. And you just hit the, the go button. Oh, there you go. It's, it's sort of got a little bit confused here. It sort of picked up on the, the pattern of the crane and it's put it in there. But if I'd have been a bit more, more precise with my masking, it would have done a really good job. And as you can see, it, it sort of predicted the continuation of the line, which I just find, I still find really amazing. OK. The next app I'm going to look at is an app called Snapseed. And it's a really great general app for doing lots of the, the very standard things you would do in Photoshop. Can we switch back? OK, so I've got this photo here. It's a, good, it's a nice image, called a nice expression on the guy's face. Uh, I was lucky in that it's got eyes written on the billboard in the background. So I just want to, it's a nice basic image, but I turned it into something just a little bit more dramatic, something just a little bit more ci cinematic, if you like. And I'm going to show you a couple of the basic things that I did to get to that image. Switch back, please. OK, so you've got a range of different tools here in Snapseed. And this button here, Tune Image, allows you to change the, the basic variables in an image. So brightness, you can make it brighter. Or contrast, you can make it more contrasty. And it has some nice um, features like ambience, which gives it a sort of a cinematic, more cinematic feel, brings out more of the skin tones. So I'm going to choose that. It has a um, really great button, which a lot of other apps have, have equivalents to, called uh, Drama. And I haven't analyzed exactly what drama does, but it really brings things out of the shadows. It increases the contrast. I'll just show you. Yes, yeah, you can see that the image is no longer an image of just a mobile phone camera that's been taken randomly. It's starting to look a bit more, a bit more cinematic.
and there's also a thing called details, which is basically sharpening. And again, if you if you watch the face, you'll see that the face is you can start to see the wrinkles in the face as I use that that button. So I'm sort of getting somewhere now, and now the more fundamental things, like it's just a little bit wonky. I just straighten it out a little bit. That's better. And perhaps I want to crop out that top strip there, which is a bit distracting to the eye as well. So use the crop button. So as you can see, you can really transform an image. You don't want to do anything, do anything particularly fancy, but you, you just want to make it a little bit more dramatic. And it's just very, very easy to do with an app like Snapseed. OK, right. We look, that's, so that's basic editing. Now. Uh, with Snapseed, what I was doing there was that I was, I was changing variables in an image in the whole of the picture. Yeah, I was making the whole of the picture brighter or making the whole of the picture more contrasty or less contrasty. But there are apps that allow you to just change the brightness of particular areas in, in an image or to change the contrast in a particular area. So it's really good for a picture like this where I just wanted to make the, the river just a little bit brighter. Or this picture here where the, I'd already noticed there was some light shining up into this, this woman's face. And I just wanted to emphasize that by making make just her face a little bit brighter. You can also sharpen up people's faces as well. It's particularly good for, for images where you've got people's faces. Okay. OK, so here I'm going to use uh, an app called Fil FilterStorm. And more than any other app, this, this app is the closest thing you get to Photoshop uh, for the mobile phone. Photosh Photoshop do actually produce an app, but this is really like the Rolls Royce of apps. You can really do some sophisticated stuff with this. So I got this picture here, and I sort of quite liked it. For some reason, it was, a, it was a day when there wasn't much traffic on the road. So the street was completely clear. And I also I used the drama button already in Snapseed to make the clouds a bit more dramatic, a bit more contrasty. But what struck me about the building was this old, lovely Victorian building with a beautiful white facade. But the picture hasn't really brought out the facade very well, as I sort of saw it in reality. But what you can do with an app like FilterStorm is just make the brightness of, for example, in this image, the front of the building a lot brighter. So that's what I'm going to do. Tap on brightness. OK. That shows you a sort of a before and after. The, the right-hand side is the, um, the, the brighter, the, the adjustment I've made. Now, if I wanted to just apply it to the whole of the picture, I'd just tap OK there. But in this case, I just want to apply it to the front of the building. I don't want to lose those nice um, dramatic clouds. So what I do is I tap on the mask function. And using a, a brush, my finger. Again, I can zoom up just to really get into the detail. I just tap on the part that I want to increase in brightness. So it's an amazing tool. It's like giving the building a, a fresh, fresh coat of paint. OK.
Right. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, blending. And this is a, a, an amazing app that really allows you to go to town with your imagination by, as the name suggests, blending two or more photos together. And I remember admiring someone's work on Instagram, and she created these amazing dreamscapes of weird and wonderful things, like a Dali painting or something. And I said to her, wow, I really, it's an amazing work you're doing. She said, yeah, I was, I was laid up in bed for six months with a bad back, so I couldn't get out to take photos. But she had everything she needed on her camera roll and in her imagination, and she'd just gone to town creating these really amazing dreamscapes, if you like. Now, this is just a basic um, example of, of something, something I did. Um, and it's really good because you can, you can take photos that you're not particularly excited about. You can use photos that you've, you, know, you, you took and you thought, well, yeah, that's, that's OK, but I'm not going to be able to use it too much for anything. But if you, if you combine photos together, suddenly you get something a little bit more interesting. So here I've got a photo of a friend who was doing Movember, and he was shaving off his beard for Movember. And a picture, a little bit, a little bit dark, of, a, of the inside of a church. But blending it together and then doing a bit of apping and adding a little bit of text, so suddenly it, it's created an image that is, you know, something quite interesting. It has a little, bit, little bit of a narrative. It's perhaps God looking down on his congregation in, in church. And here's another example. And. This was taken from blending together three, three photos that I'd taken using an app that has a burst mode on it. So I got a f quite a few images very, very quickly, and then I just blended two or three of them together. And there are some people out there on, in, the, in the mobile photography world who are really developing this as, a, as an art form. And it's really coming to sort of characterize uh, many of the big competitions that are now in mobile photography. Here's one particular guy who I, who I like. And he, he produces these sort of gothic images, just using often pictures of his daughter. Sometimes you can't quite work out what's in the images, but it's created a, a new sort of image. Lots of little gothic things going on there. OK, so I'll, I'll show you how easy it is to do that. OK, so <laughs> this is one of those apps that is, is, is supposed to be so intuitive, they give you zero indication as to how to, to make the thing work. But what you basically do is you tap on that, that button on the bottom left to open one image, and then you tap on that button on the bottom right to open a second image. So here I've got quite a nice image, but you know, there's not a lot going on there. But I had another image that I thought, well, yeah, it's also very stark and not a lot going on, but they might work well together. So I've, I've sort of effectively put the tree that I had on my camera roll in the landscape. And by sliding this slider backwards and forwards, you can make the blend. Um, you can make one image stronger than another. And there are lots of different blending modes that you can use as well. So it's a really powerful tool in terms of giving you creativity. But as well as 
giving you creativity, you can also use it as a practical tool. For example, if you get one shot that has got some elements that you really like in of a particular scene, and you get another shot of the same scene with other particular elements, but you don't get all the elements in the same image, you can cheat a little bit and take all the elements that you like and put them all together. And I'm going to show you how to do that now. Okay, so I was. This is down at the South Bank. You might recognise it. Uh, there's some this concrete, and there are some beautiful evening lights, some golden light. And I was getting pictures of people walking by, and I got this picture here, which I thought was pretty good. You know, some people's feet walking by, and the the, the red skirts. But then I got another picture with the shadow of some people's heads. And I thought, how about if I could just have everything, have all those three elements in one picture? So, so you can see they're, they're not quite exactly the same. Uh, they weren't taken from exactly the same place. So I have to move the top one around. You see, you can move it around. You can li line it up like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete part of the top image. So I'm just effectively creating a mask. You see the lady's skirt has appeared on that side, and over here, the man's legs. So can you, can you, it's a tool you can use in a very practical way as, being, as well as being a very creative tool. OK, so that's five sort of fairly fundamental uh, tools that you can use in mobile photography. But there are a gazillion load of apps out there that you can do some amazing stuff with. This is an app uh, called um, Shock My Pick, which turns a picture into a sort of a Van Gogh style picture. This is an app called Tomb Paint, which again, transforms an image into a sort of cartoon type thing. There are many apps that allow you to turn an image into a painting. If I can just switch over, I'll show you one. OK, so I've got a picture here of some people I took just recently. And what this app does is it converts the picture into a sort of a, a, a painting. It takes a while. I think this is part of the fun. You sort of see the picture as it develops and appears before your eyes. And there are, there are different functions in this particular app that supposedly allow you to recreate the image in the style of particular painters, Cezanne, Van Gogh, etc. cetera. 
And the fun really comes when you start playing with multiple apps, when you, when you start stacking apps. And with, with Blender, for, exi for example, you can transform an image into a painting like this and then blend it with the original version of the same image and just have certain parts of the image looking painterly and other parts not. So uh, as you can see, it sort of creates a, a painting out of a normal, normal image. And there are apps that allow you to take multiple photos of a particular thing, perhaps if it's too wide to fit into the viewfinder, and it, it will stick all the photos together. And it works much better than a fisheye lens because you don't lose as much resolution. Decimate is an incredible app that chops up your image into, I say, random, random pixels, but it, it gives you a range of different ways in which it chops up your image, and it reassembles them into quite amazing pictures. And again, with Blender, you can choose to have part of an image pixelated or transformed in this, in this way or, or not. So you can create some you know, quite interesting, modernist sort of images. And here's an app which is about taking photos rather than processing photos. And as the name suggests, it allows you to take photos using um, long exposures. So it produces images that have maybe 20 or 30 frames like this, and it puts them all together and properly exposes the image. So it allows you to create these images that give a sense of um, motion or, or movement. Anyone recognize that? Yeah. Uh, there's an app called Diptych, which gives you a set of frames, and you you put your pictures into uh, different frames. I was <laughs> it's going to sound awful, but I was following this guy around. Looks like he looked like an interesting character, so I was getting some photos of him, and it seemed like an interesting, you know, thing. He was carrying this battered old suit, this briefcase. So I took lots of photos of him. And with Diptych, you could, put the, you could put the various different photos into various different parts of the frame to create something a bit interesting. This is another app that I, I think is actually being incorporated, well, I know it's being incorporated into the Samsung phones now, allows you to take something that's moving So there's, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with some of your photos. So yeah, use, and this is something I tell my students on my course, you know, let's really put all these apps, put all these tool, tools into our toolbox, and when we find an image or we have something in our head that, that the tool is right for, we can pull out the tool and use it. But there's also no substitute for a, for a good photo, for good raw material. So sometimes an image, and this is something you'll, you'll get the hang of as you take more and more photos and, and think about how to add them up. Sometimes an image is good just as an image without very much apping. And I mentioned at the beginning that I'm also a, a professional photographer with a big camera. I send my, my photos to my agency, and they try and sell my photos for me. And I've been sending them some of my iPhone photos. And 
my biggest seller to date, so I haven't been a professional photographer for long, but my biggest selling photo is, is this one here, which I took with the iPhone. So, you know, don't listen to people when they're trying to sell you a, a, a 3,000 pound camera. You can get a good picture with your, with your iPhone or your, your mobile device. So I hope that was interesting, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Hi. I would like to ask, uh, as uh, phone cameras get better and better every day, uh, won't, isn't that uh, gap between professional photography and uh, mobile photography disappearing? Yeah, it is. Yeah, most certainly. And a lot of the agencies now are, are accepting, accepting photos from, from people that have taken, taken their pictures with their mobile, mobile cameras. But somehow that, that makes it even more difficult now to get a really, really good picture. There's more competition, so the picture you, you get is going to be really a lot tougher to, to get and so, in a, in a way, it's going to require more, more skill to get the really best photos. But yeah, I, 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 I agree with you, it is. Everyone is becoming a photographer now, yeah. Um, hi. So, I do some mobile application development. I was wondering if you have any, anything you, that you think is missing in the market, anything you'd like to see as a photographer that doesn't exist yet? Um, That'd be quite a hard question, so uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it is quite hard. Um... I have an easier version of the question. Okay. But yeah, um, which is basically, uh, all, there's a lot of stuff obviously for the iPhone and iOS. For Android, there isn't quite as much. Yeah. Is there anything you know that's missing in Android that's on oh, iOS yeah. that you have? Yeah, well, I, I switched to the, the Samsung S4 about four months ago. So I've been writing about this on my blog, actually. I've done about four or five comparisons of the iPhone and the S4. Um, and yeah, uh, there are loads of apps that you can't get in Android that you can get on, on iOS. And the ones I really miss on Android are uh, Slow Shutter, for example, which was developed by, I don't know, a couple of guys in a basement somewhere. You know, they've got three followers on Twitter. So, you know, they're obviously not going to be able to just produce a version in Android overnight. Um, but otherwise, Hipstamatic is not available on Android. And I, I really love Hipstamatic and would love to, to have that on Android. Um, but, but there's Photoshop and there's Snapseed. So it, I, I've taken some time to adapt and just work with what I've got. But. Um, I've been doing a you know long-term comparison of the two, and I have to tell you the the Samsung is is like three nil down at half time, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. That's it. Okay. Thanks very much for listening.